So you want to get started in lighting for movies. Basically what you're going to want to do is one easy step, just one easy step. Take your paycheck, you know, after you paid for your rent, your food, your bills, take the $10 you have left over and put 5,000 of those dollars into wireless LED light panels, batteries not included. Welcome back. I'm Gus, I'm an editor, an animator, and a visual effects artist. Today we'll be talking in depth about lighting your LEGO films, and I'll also be answering your questions about lighting specifically. Now, lighting for film is an incredibly complex topic to jump into, and you can spend hours or weeks or years just on lighting alone. So here today I'll be giving you the tools to improve or get started. And throughout the series I'll probably do a few more episodes about lighting specifically just because there's so much you can get into. So here we go. And yes, here we are again with another Brick Film School two weeks in a row. This is simply because I decided to jump into an insane lightsaber duel as my next animation project, which takes a lot of time. Just so we're clear on these weekly uploads, if there's ever a week that is not LEGO animation, that is simply because I'm working on a larger project that is large scale and insane. So get excited and I hope you enjoy this video. Lighting is basically what you use to add depth to your scene. If a scene is lit completely flat, your images aren't going to look very cinematic, and it will render something that has the potential to seem visually interesting to just not be visually interesting at all. You can spend all the time in the world creating a very interesting looking set, but if you don't put the time and the effort into finding the best way to light that set, all of your hard work and effort won't really resonate with the audience as much as it could have. There's a reason the top guns on a film set are the director, the producer, and the director of photography, or the DP. The director on the film set generally has the vision for the story, interacts with the actors, interacts with all the departments to make the vision a reality. But their involvement with what the image looks like at the end of the day can really vary. You have directors that just want to talk to the actors, and then you have directors that really have a hand on exactly what the film is going to look like on screen. And then your producer is in charge of managing the set, the money. The director of photography specifically is in charge of making sure the camera is capturing a spectacular and well-balanced image that is going to ultimately help tell the story. They use light to carefully paint every image you see on film. So basically, now you're working as your film's director of photography. Finding the best way to paint pictures to create images that are impactful and resonate with your audience. So if the only question you're asking is, can I see them? Maybe try asking yourself a couple more questions like, what is the emotion of the scene? What am I trying to convey in this scene? What are the emotions behind this shot specifically? And most importantly, can this look better? Before we jump into chapter one, be sure to like and subscribe. It helps out a ton. And also click that bell button if you want to be notified for the next video to come out on this channel. What you need to light Lego. What's more important than what you have is what you do with what you have. The primary core technique when it comes to lighting a subject is three point lighting. Key light, fill light, and backlight. Key light is for your subject specifically, be it a character or an object. The key light is meant to highlight the subject of a shot. The fill light is to decrease the intensity in the shadows of your scene. So if your key light's coming from this angle, then your fill light is just kind of brightening up those shadows a little bit. Not always necessary, but a good thing to have. Then your backlight is meant to separate your subject from the background. I'm going to switch this guy out because he's a little bright. Uh, it's meant to separate your subject from the background, mostly creating this rim around your character. So there's just a little bit of separation and also you kind of add a little bit more depth. This is like as primitive of an example as you can get, but it kind of just shows kind of how each light operates in the scene. You have your key light, your primary light for your character, fill light to fill out the shadows a little bit, and then you have your backlight. It really separates your character from the background, giving him an outline, and this just kind of adds a lot of depth to your scene. So that's three-point lighting. From there, you can go anywhere, and there are no like specific rules that you must follow, but this is kind of the core of where every thought process starts. Hmm, why is this scene lacking depth and looking flat? I probably need a backlight. And there you have it, you know, it's just those problem-solving tools. Learning anything in film is just learning different tools to throw into your toolbox. So when it comes to each shot, you have the exact knowledge to find the way, the best way to tackle it. What I use. So what I use for my lighting setup is just three of these desk lamps that 
are just a little bit bigger than usual. They clamp to the desk, so they're kind of out of my way and not on my table. And also they're extremely crappy. They just come right apart. There's like the metal frame, but it's just plastic joints. So it broke and all of them are broken like this. And so I just have to be careful with how I'm moving the lights. And also the bases are broken as well. So if I pull on the light too hard, it'll come off the table and then it's like, you know, five minutes of fixing that. So my point is that you don't need anything fancy to do this. These light bulbs are standard household light bulbs. They're like a warm temperature LED from my local grocery store. They're the equivalent of 75 watts. I just find that that wattage just gives me more to work with and it's easy to kind of, you know, point the light away from my set to decrease the amount of light on my set so I don't really need to change out the wattage in the bulbs. Oh God. So you don't need anything fancy to get started or to even keep going. I also use a flashlight. I think this was like $15. It's just nice because it can change its focus. You know, it goes in tight like that or wide. I usually just set it down, you know, next to the character off camera for certain things if it needs to be more dramatic or in a Star Wars scene if I need like light shining from a random place because Star Wars does that. <laughs> um, I can use it as that light to give me that kind of backlit look. And one more thing is gels in general. I mean, if you want to know anything about these, <laughs> I mean, this is the front of this one. You can probably get these on Amazon or B&H. It's just nice to have colors that can quickly change, <laughs> you know, the lighting of a scene to work for what you're doing. If I'm doing like nighttime, I usually incorporate a blue gel. If I'm doing uh, like sunset, dusk, or dawn, or something like that, I incorporate like a pink gel and maybe a blue gel as well. It's just kind of playing with color. There's no specific technique I use. I just kind of look at like a picture as reference and I'm like, okay, now I just need to kind of find a way to recreate that lighting mood. And so then, you know, you just kind of work from there. Also another cheap lighting thing that I have, these are just LED. It's like an LED light strip that, you know, I don't know, you can put around your room or whatever. It has like every color on the rainbow or something and $15 for a roll on Amazon. And it's just good to have some extra little lights on hand. I use it for like the Spider-Man home saga uh, nighttime stuff just because I just wanted some BD lights outside. So you can see you don't really need anything super specific like other than three desk lamps are good to have and a flashlight's convenient. But it's not like you need something super fancy or you need to invest in a kit of brick lights for $50 or something. I always wanted brick lights but you know it's about working with what you have right now and then your problem solving is better because of that. Practicals. What we all like most of all when it comes to lighting is practicals or lighting that you actually see on camera that's actually contributing to lighting the set. This is the ultimate challenge when it comes to lighting Lego because they're so dang small. <laughs> so how do you go about making that light look real or that lamp look real? And like for Star Wars, how do you make it look like those lights on the wall are working, the buttons on the wall are working? Now you can spend 50 bucks or more to buy some brick lights but if you're like me and you randomly happen to have 50 bucks of extra spending money, the last thing on my list of things I need to survive are brick lights. So how do we work with this, a couple lights, you know, I'll show you right now. So I'm going to just use the flashlight for now because these lights are lighting myself in the background. But you don't need a flashlight to do this stuff. You can just pull your light down behind the wall and this can work. You see in the camera there. Let's see, I'll uh... Use this. So this, you can see, it looks like this wall is actual light rather than just white Lego bricks or something else. So it's a really cool look already. And basically, how I go about building something like this is you just kind of decide where you want the light to come through. That's the clear bricks. And then wherever you don't want it to come through because light does shine through Lego bricks, you're going to want to block that off however you can. Uh, you can use like I did here, just black Lego bricks just taped to this wall. If you're fortunate enough to have gaffer's tape lying around, you can use that as well. It's much just, it's just cleaner and it doesn't let any light through much more simply. And you can see here, it's like, you know, it's completely blacked out and it's just using one strip of tape. Um, usually light would be shining through every single one of these little holes. So if you wanna do like a button panel, something like that, uh, you're gonna want these bricks right here. Um, I'm just going to build a quick little wall here. So 
So you can see here that you have little holes in the wall. Um, basically, if you are seeing from the camera's perspective, once the camera's actually right here, if you're seeing anything, any spill through the bricks, then you're gonna wanna resort to tape, uh, setting up bricks behind uh, where any gaps are, anything you can just to block out the light. Again, remember, if the camera's not seeing it, it doesn't matter how crappy the back of your set looks because no one is ever going to see that. So you can see the light is coming through. It looks pretty fancy, but if you just wanna add color, from that point on, you can use bricks. There you go, there's a little red light. You can use any clear Lego brick to give just a little bit more color into these backdrops. And then when it comes to things like this, you can either leave it white or um, you can just cut up these things. Like, you know, these gels, they, aren't, they don't have to stay in pristine condition. If you need a little corner of it, you can use it. You can cut it off and then plop it behind here and then use it as like, well, that's a bad example, so clear. But you can use it as like a color adjustment on anything like this. So you can cut them up, use them how you need them to be used. So you can see very little work to actually get some practical lights on your set uh, that look very cool and Star Wars-y. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated if you're talking about lamps and stuff like that because uh, at that point, you kind of do need brick lights if you're going to do it practically because you just can't actually get a light in there for real, so it's not actually illuminating, so you run into issues there. Um, I've usually just found ways to work around actually needing the light actually in the set. There are ways to work around not having brick lights. You still do need to work with your limitations, but that is part of film in general. You're always gonna have limitations and you're always gonna have to learn how to work with them. And usually you don't need that lamp sitting in the center of the room. And usually you can get away with wall elements alone. So those are my tips there. Highlight your shadows. Now this is just something I wanna to touch on in this episode really quick. Don't be afraid of shadows. You don't wanna make images look as bad as Solo just because it's your style to make muddy and unusable footage. If you're smart about your shadows and know how to use them to your advantage, that's what will really add some dimension to your images. Also, like we talked about blowing out windows and doorways using light, you can make your worlds feel more limitless by using darkness and shadow. It's just another way to make your sets look bigger and cooler than they really are while working with a limited amount of materials. And a Hollywood example of that is for one of the J.J. Star Trek movies, I think it was the second one, uh, there was a sequence that needed to take place very briefly in like an enormous hangar, you know, where there'd be ships around and there's like a runway and all this kind of stuff. But it's like a small scene. It takes place there for like a couple seconds. And so the debate is always, okay, do we computer generate this or do we make it a real set? But J.J.'s thought was just to add some key lights to highlight the runway and just mask the rest in shadow and the audience's mind will kind of fill in the rest and imagine ships off camera and maybe there's like very small digital enhancements but that just shows that these kind of small little techniques can be used all the way up the line to professional films because ultimately you're always going to be trying to save a dollar here a dollar there and sometimes these lighting tricks are what can save that extra dollar so to practice them now is really great and just to be clear I've never been a fan of those Star Trek movies, but even bad movies or movies that you don't like that much can still teach you a lot in terms of filmmaking, be it teach you what doesn't work, or in this case, a technique that was actually very effective even though the movies surrounding it just didn't work for me. So never blow off any movie completely. There's still value to be found in those small ways. Light flicker. Light flicker is the number one problem that people have with stop motion animation especially when they're first starting out. How do we get rid of it? Here we go. Step number one, black out your windows. Make sure there's no light coming in from outside because the sunlight outside is always changing. Every second it's changing. So when you're taking 10 to 20 to 30 seconds in between each frame you take, the light has already changed a ton. So you're gonna work, wanna work in a dark space, work at night, or black out your windows. Step two, stable hardware. I'll get into my desk specifically and all my equipment and stuff in a later video, but for now, just make sure your table doesn't wobble around too much. Uh, make sure your lights are sturdy, which most desk lamps are, so you shouldn't have an issue. And if you're looking for a table, solid wood is very heavy, so if you can find a solid wood table, mine's just used, piece of crap. Just if it's the heavier, the better, I've found, because it's not gonna go anywhere. Step three, secure your set. So you're never gonna wanna work like this with the set just completely loose like this, because 
as you start animating, anytime I touch it, it's moving just a little bit. Uh, so you're gonna wanna use blue painter's tape. It seems to be a go-to for animators just because it has a strong hold and it's not insanely expensive. I think they might be $6, while gaffer's tape on the other hand, which is like what people use for video shoots and stuff like that, that's like $15 or something. So you're gonna wanna tape down all four corners so then your set isn't gonna go anywhere. It just doesn't look too great in these behind the scenes things, that's why I don't have it on there all the time. Step four, camera settings. Make sure your camera, if you're using a DSLR or something like that, make sure your camera is set to manual. Because once you set your white balance, your ISO, your f-stop, you aren't gonna want those to change mid-shot because your lighting in your video will be going all over the place. So if you have manual settings, make sure you're using those. In terms of phone apps, the app should be taking care of this. So you're gonna wanna pay attention to the other steps in this process. Step five, wear dark colors. Make sure you wear black or dark colors when animating because if you're wearing bright colors like this shirt or this flannel, you'll act as a big, huge reflector uh, bouncing light back at your set and if you move at all, the lighting is going to go all over the place. So wear dark colors, wear black while doing animation. Step six, extras. So after all of this, if you're like me and still have problems, <laughs> like my parents' house had very unstable electricity, like, you know, the lights would kind of dim or be brighter, or dim or be brighter. So I got a power supply that basically is a big battery that takes in the energy from the house, charges the batteries, and then the output of energy from the battery is always consistent. It didn't eliminate all flicker, but if you do want to try something and your house's electricity isn't just constant, it's a good thing to try if you're able to do that. And after every single thing has been tried, sometimes you're going for that perfect image where there's literally no flicker, no nothing, then the computer has to come in. And then you kind of have to work with final touches in there. So I use After Effects and I'll go into that in another video because it's a little separate from this. But try all of those things. You're gonna to wanna to do every single one of those things I previously said. And then these extras are kind of the last straw kind of thing. Never lose hope. Light flicker can always be eliminated. It's all about the time and effort you can put into each shot. So there you go. Oh my god, we're head off a shower. Q&A time. Now it's time for your questions via Instagram. If you wanna be a part of my Instagram community, I post every single day, and you'll potentially be able to make your way into these videos by having your questions answered on there as well. Explain color dells slash tissue paper, color lights, explain nighttime lighting. So I wouldn't personally use like LED lights that change color because the way the camera processes those colors like especially blue It doesn't like turn out as nice So I would much prefer gels over colored lights for nighttime lighting It's really a balance of you have your harsh blue gel That's like the moonlight and then you kind of work with a little bit of a fill or backlight That doesn't have to be blue. It can just be standard, but like you just keep it very dim around your set blue equals night <laughs> And when it comes to uh, visual noise, it just comes down to camera settings. Making sure your ISO is as low as possible. And we'll have a whole other video all on cameras coming very soon. How can you make lighting look more cinematic? So that just comes down to first spending time on building your set. And then you just really need to start breaking down shots from movies to figure out what they're doing. Uh, movies do use a lot of practicals. That's why we like that because it, it like makes it feel a little bit more cinematic because there's actual practical light in the scene. But yeah, so it's just the set and then using inspiration as a starting point. And as you are taking inspiration, you'll kind of find your footing in your own cinematic style. And um, that's kind of how everybody gets started out. By imitating the greats, and then you find your own style off of that. Where do you get small lights for details for a very good price? Uh, I don't really have a good tip for that because I personally haven't really had the privilege to buy little Lego lights. But before you do invest in that, just make sure you are using the lights you have to their full potential because little lights can get very expensive very fast. When it comes to outdoor stuff, you don't really need to put gels on your lights. On occasion I'll use a blue gel, but usually I find they block out too much light. So it's about just kind of hitting the set with as much light as possible, having them as high and away from the set as possible. And then from there, honestly, the blue sky is kind of what does the trick more than anything. So if it's sunset, you're looking at the light being over here more. So you're gonna want this, want to light the set from this way uh, more than anything. And then if it's like morning, same from the other side, but the morning would be uh, maybe like pink or purple or 
and blue gels and uh, that kind of thing to give that look. Sunset would be orange gels. So it does depend on what time of day, but the real thing is just incorporate skies into the backgrounds of shots and it'll feel like it's outdoors. And that'll do it for the Q&A portion of this video. Again, if you want to be a part of it, make sure to follow on Instagram for pretty much daily Lego content. And there you go. I hope this helps you take your lighting to the next level. If I missed anything that you want to see covered in a future lighting tips video, just comment that down below. Like and subscribe and turn on notifications. The animation is an extremely difficult realm to gain any traction on YouTube, so those small things actually help immensely to keep these videos going. So, on to the next one.